that would be great. So, let's see. so welcome. My name is Greg Newton. Um, I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, and we are currently closed. We've been closed since March uh, um, because we are located inside the LGBT Community Center in the village, which has also been closed uh, since March 13th and uh, will remain closed for the rest of 2020. So that means we're closed for the rest of 2020, but we've been doing online events like this one um, and we're gonna keep doing those. So please check out our website, bgsqd.com and you can see what's coming up. Um, oh, I had my book here, but it's gone. Uh, tomorrow night we have an event called Poor Queer Studies, a book by Matt Brim um, about queer studies and confronting elitism in the university. I'm gonna be part of that panel, so I'm kind of excited about that. But tonight we are here to join Lisa Robinson and Lauren Simpkin-Burke uh, for a little story time and a conversation um, about their new book, Were I Not a Girl? The Inspiring and True Story of Dr. James Berry. Some of you have already purchased the book from the Bureau. We have an online store now. So thank you very much for supporting us by buying books from us. And also thank you for the many donations that we received. We very much appreciate it. It really helps um, us to keep doing what we're doing. And so we can have Zoom meetings and uh, record them and get them out on the, on the webs. Um, so we will post this as well on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you know anyone who's missed it and wanted to attend, uh, they can check it out on YouTube. So that's my housekeeping. And I'm going to introduce our two guests, and then we'll get started. So Lisa Robinson is a physician and psychotherapist who lives near Boston. She is also the author of two fiction picture books, Pirates Don't Go to Kindergarten, and Pippa's Night Parade, as well as another nonfiction picture book, Madame Saki, Revolutionary Rope Dancer. And you can visit her online at author-lisa-robinson.com. Lauren Simkin-Burke is an award-winning illustrator working with clients such as the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, and Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance. Burke's artwork has graced covers of books such as Katie Rain Hill's Rethinking Normal, the Paris Reviews, The Writer's Chapbook, and the first edition of Susan Stryker's Transgender History. This is their first picture book. And you can visit them at SimkinBurke.com. And Bureau folks, people who've been to the Bureau of General Services Queer Division in New York may also know Lauren from the lovely postcards that we've had from them for a few years now. Yeah. Um, such as, I love you more than bacon. <laughs> That's the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> um, but those are really great. And uh, you've probably seen them on our windowsill at the Bureau. So please give a warm welcome to both Lisa and to Lauren. You can unmute for that. <laughs> All right, um, I'll take it from there. So hello everyone, thank you so much um, for coming to our book launch. This is exciting. This is my first um, ever online book launch. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to share the book with you um, and particularly excited for you to see Lauren's um, gorgeous, gorgeous illustrations um, and hear more about how Lauren created the art. Um, in preparation for this event, I've been rereading one of the um, some of my source material and reminding myself, um, uh, I just maybe had forgotten, but James Berry was an incredibly resourceful, feisty and outspoken person. Um, and as I was rereading this biography, I um, came across a quote that I wanna share with you that um, speaks to his character as well as the current political moment. It refers to a trait that James, got James into a lot of trouble. And um, it's what John Lewis would call good trouble. Um, and the quote is, like many reforming practitioners, Dr. Barry saw corruption and incompetence everywhere. And sooner or later, his zeal to eradicate them would get him into trouble. 
James Barry had an ungovernable impulse to speak truth to power. I love that. <laughs> I thought that was right on. Um, very apropos of the moment. So um, I'm going to now um, practice my new skill of screen sharing and um, read you the book. So here we go. So, Were I Not a Girl, The Inspiring and True Story of Dr. James Barry. Imagine living at a time when you couldn't be the person you felt you were inside. You couldn't be true to yourself. This is a story about someone who refused to let that happen, Dr. James Barry. It wasn't until he died that his story became known. Although he'd been born Margaret Ann Bulkley, he lived for more than 50 years as Dr. James Barry. Why did Margaret become James? She never said, nor did he. Let me tell you a little more about what we do and don't know. Margaret Ann Bulkley was born in Cork, Ireland, sometime around 1789. We can't be sure. There is no official birth record. When Margaret was growing up, most girls weren't sent to school. And so she stayed home or worked at the family grocery store. Women weren't supposed to own property or hold jobs other than governess, maid, or factory worker. And so even though Margaret had big dreams, the future looked small. In 1798, the people of Ireland rebelled against their British rulers. Margaret admired the soldiers marching through town. Were I not a girl, I would be a soldier, she later wrote. I must honestly confess I would prefer a sword to a musket, and I should like a pair of colors. But women could not become soldiers. I had to refresh my memory about what colors were, and it turns out it's referring to the battle flags um, that they would carry. So when Margaret was 16, her father lost his store and home, then abandoned the family. Hoping to find work, Margaret and her mother braved traveling to London across the war-tossed Celtic Sea. Margaret's uncle, James Barry, who had just died, had left them money enough for food and lodging. Margaret scoured newspaper ads for work as a governess. Alas, she lacked the required education. One of her uncle's friends kindly agreed to teach her French, history, arithmetic, geography, and writing. Meanwhile, Margaret tended to the four-year-old son of another family friend and devoured the books in his library, especially the medical books. On walks through the city, Margaret often passed Middlesex Hospital where medical students hurried to and fro how she yearned to join them, but women could not become doctors. So Margaret, who wanted to be a soldier and a doctor, took charge. She tugged off her stockings, dress, stays, and chemise, chopped off her red gold curls, and vanished. In her place appeared a young man in breeches, a high collared shirt, a cravat, and a tailcoat. Choosing her uncle's name, Margaret Bulkley became James Barry. 19-year-old James boarded a fishing boat bound for Scotland, then enrolled in the Edinburgh Medical School. There he studied night and day. I have my hands full of delightful business and work from seven o'clock in the morning until two the next, he wrote. How could a teenager outwit that many medical students and doctors? In truth, not everyone believed that James belonged in medical school. In his last year, the rumors began. James's smooth skin, slight build, and high voice led people to suspect that he was a mere boy. Perhaps he's no older than 12, whispered his fellow students. The university declared him too young to take the final exams essential to becoming a doctor. 
Despite the university's decision, James refused to give up. Another family friend stepped in on his behalf. There were no rules against boys sitting for the required exams, the friend argued. And so the university senate allowed James to take on the challenge. He passed all the tests. James was officially a doctor. The young doctor moved to London for surgical training. There he became quite a dandy. He loved elegant fashion, satin waistcoats, lace cuffs and collars, leather boots polished to a lustrous shine. In 1813, he enlisted in the military. Finally, James's dream of becoming a doctor and a soldier had come true. How did he avoid being challenged? Physical exams weren't required and His Majesty's forces really needed surgeons. During his military service, James explored the world. He sailed to South Africa, the West Indies, and St. Helena, accompanied by a small menagerie. Over the next 50 years, James delivered babies, fought a duel, fell in love, and demanded clean water, fresh vegetables, and proper medical care in prisons and hospitals. In 1858, he was promoted to one of the highest military ranks, Inspector General of Hospitals. James Berry died at the age of 76, or was it 70? That's a question that will never be answered, like many others about James's life. Sometimes, no matter how hard we search, answers remain hidden. And my favorite, favorite, Last page, still one answer is clear. James was living his truth. I love the shoes. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the back matter. Um, so if you're able to get your hands on the book, what it uh, does is talks a little bit more about some details of James's life um, and also includes a brief discussion of the notion of gender as a spectrum. Um, with a wide range of possibilities. Um, and now I'm going to figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> there we go, got it. <laughs> Excellent. I will pass the torch to Lauren. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Okay, so um, for some reason, when I'm preparing um, any sort of presentation, I'm incapable of doing so without titling said presentation. So I've called this Finding James and Rebuilding His World. Um, when I uh, sort of came onto this project, um, I was provided with the manuscript, um, which was still, it was mostly done, but there were some changes that were going to be made. Um, so I had a version of it, but I didn't know how much would change from what I had seen. So I basically had um, two or maybe even three months um, where I was sort of on my own doing my own research, which was very helpful, but also meant that in some cases I went down certain rabbit holes that weren't necessarily necessary. Um, but where I started was finding all of the images I could find of James. So. To the best of my knowledge, I think these all were, um, so it's, it's two paintings, two drawings, two photographs. I think they, clearly the photographs were taken when he was alive. The, the caricature, that's the full, um, the full body caricature was done when he was alive. And I think the others might've been as well, although I don't have verification about who created the, those, three, um, those three pieces of art portraits. The um, caricature was drawn by a cartoonist, an illustrator who was um, on Corfu at the same time that James was living there. Um, and his dog, Psyche, is included in the picture. I don't know who the, the man that is with James um, in the photograph on the right is. I tried to find that information and I, I couldn't verify it with enough sources. Um, unfortunately, but I assume that the photographs were taken sort of later in his life, um, either in his sort of late 60s or early 70s. Uh, the second thing I did was to create a timeline um, that uh, 
showed where he was um, or where, you know, whenever he moved or whenever he uh, changed rank so that I would be able to keep track of where he was, what he'd been doing and what kind of uniform he would have been um, wearing at the time so that no matter what part of his life was gonna be represented in the book that I would have a sort of roadmap um, to, to go from. Um, so as uh, the book says, uh, James uh, was born in Cork, um, then moved to London with his mother um, as a teenager, um, then moved to Edinburgh for medical school then moved back to London for surgical training. Um, then when he joined the army, he was stationed in Chelsea and then Plymouth for a few years um, before um, being posted in Cape Town. Uh, he was in Cape Town for a while. Um, and then uh, he, um, I think he actually at one point during when he was in Cape Town, he like sort of left um, for a year or two, but um, he had a very close relationship with the uh, governor of Cape Town. Um, it's sort of the sort of love, love affair of his life. Um, and when uh, Charles Somerset, the, the governor of Cape Town, uh, was ill um, in England, uh, James went back to England to take care of him for a couple of years. Um, and then sort of rejoined the army, um, not rejoined, but was able to, to go back to service um, once he um, felt he was done with that, once Somerset had passed away. Uh, then he went to Jamaica and St. Helena and the West Indies and then Malta, um, then Corfu. Then um, he wasn't stationed in Crimea, but he, he I, I don't, maybe it's not right to call it a vacation, but he, took time off and went to Crimea, which is I think a perfect example of the kind of person James was. Like he wasn't going to take a break and sort of do something to like relax. He went to the place where war was happening and um, went to a hospital uh, there that was run by the British army or the British government, I guess. Um, it's actually the hospital where Florence, Florence Nightingale was working at the time. Um, and then tried to sort of assess what things were being done wrong and tell everyone how they should be doing things in a better way. Um, he attempted to um, get stationed in Crimea, but was, um, that did not happen. Um, and then sort of soon thereafter was stationed in Canada, which is where he um, became the Inspector General of Hospitals. Um, one of the rabbit holes I went down was an entire day of researching the, the city plan for Cork, Ireland, um, as that was where James was born and grew up. And uh, during the time of, you know, between James being born and moving to London, the, um, the streets of Cork changed quite a bit from year to year. So it was actually quite confusing, but I spent an entire day researching all the different changes that happened, including um, major roads being um, built and bridges and such going over the canal and um, lots of, of movement in um, there being more um, sort of usable streets um, for, I guess, carriages and such. Um, when I first started working on the sketches, um, I was told that the book would be around 40 pages. And I had this dream that maybe it would we'd be able to do it a few pages more than 40. So my first sketches were ambitious in that way. Um, these are clearly very, um, very loose, very small thumbnail sketches. Um, I had done slightly tighter ones as well, but this was to sort of give a sense of the whole book. What I'm going to do is show you the sort of sketch to final art process for three spreads. Um, maybe not showing all of the sketches because there were about seven sketch um, stages and I wasn't able to find all of them. Um, but this is an, an example of um, two spreads from that first um, batch of sketches um, covering the period where um, James and his mother um, moved from Cork to London um, and when um, James is trying to find um, work as a governess. Um, the painting on the, the bottom left is one of his uncle's paintings. Um, 
James Berry, his uncle was a, um, was a painter, a very successful painter. Um, success at, as a painter at that time did not necessarily mean like financial stability, but he had enough um, savings when he died that, um, that James and his mother were able to at least situate themselves in London before sort of figuring out how to, to get work to survive. So these are the first sketches. It got condensed to one spread like this. Um, so this is sort of technically still the first round of sketches. Um, then it turns into this. Then this. Then this. And this is the sort of final approved sketch. Um, and this is the final art. The um, illustrations for the book are uh, created with a combination of watercolor and pencil um, and like some minor ink elements. And the ink elements are partially used as masks and partially as sort of accents of color. Um, like in these pages, um, some of the color is from pencil that's been digitally changed to certain colors and some of the colors from watercolor and some of the color was drawn in ink and then the color was changed to Julie. I don't know if that's going to make sense, but I'm gonna show some examples of the actual pieces um, individually to try and make it clear. Um, when I was doing research, I looked at a lot of things, but then at the uh, sort of when I needed to start working, I would create sheets of reference that I wanted to sort of have on hand. So these are the two of the sheets that I used um, when I was working on the the page on the left of the spread. Um, and these are some of the pieces. So the primary line in pencil on the left and the watercolor on the right, um, then more watercolor on the bottom left and the upper left portion is some pencil that's been changed to a light pink digitally. Um, the ink was primarily used as a mask, the ink on the right. Um, I have like a, a full sheet of pencil um, pattern texture that I created that I then changed to different um, sort of gradients of different colors um, for different purposes throughout the book. So um, if you're paying attention to the textures in the book, there are some sort of repeats of this pattern. And this is the, the gradient um, of the pencil that I used for, the, for that particular page. Um, and then the right are pencil pieces. Um, the people that are on the ship are on the bottom right and um, shading for the sky um, on the top. Um, when I was done finishing all the finals and they were approved, I was afraid of forgetting um, all of the, where all the reference material came from. So I decided to create diagrams of each spread and at the very least note the, the most important reference material that I used. And the part that I think is the most important of this spread is that the, the painting um, that's on the wall in the space uh, where James is looking through the paper um, is a portrait that his uncle painted, um, a portrait of Christopher Nugent. Um, so I'll go back to that just for a second so you can see in the illustration so um, it's, it's very subtle and I don't expect anyone to be paying attention to it, but I wanted there to be at least some, um, some of the James Berry, the painter in the book somewhere. So um, this is the, another sketch from the first, um, first round of sketches. This is uh, the point in the book where um, They've moved to London and James is um, working as a governess and um, trying to learn as much as possible and reading a lot of medical textbooks. Um, so this clearly was not selected for probably good reason, but I was very much uh, wanting this to move forward. So it was kind of sad that it didn't, but I, I like the final art, so I'm, I, I, I'm okay with it. Uh, this is the second version third. There's definitely a version after, maybe after this one, where the 
where the figures were changed more dramatically, but basically that was the, the version before the final. Um, and this is the final art. And if you pay attention to the back, to the books that are on the bookshelf, there is an open book on the back left that is that original book that I wanted to include as the primary image in the illustration. Uh, here are some of the reference images that I used. Um, I was looking at late Georgian um, interior decorating. Um, these uh, family friends that James was working for, um, I believe would have had fairly um, fancy, you know, uh, interior decorating, interior design, etc. So I was trying to be as accurate as possible without knowing any sort of specifics about what their home looked like. Uh, and then here is the diagram for um, for that spread. Uh, so I've noted that the um, the bust chair and table are based on um, interiors in um, early Georgian interiors by John uh, Cornforth. Um, and the open spread from that first book is a book called Design de Apre Nature, Volume One, um, illustrations by N. H. Jacob. Um, the shoes are based on a pair of shoes in the Victoria and Albert collection. Um, and the book that James is holding um, is uh, a book that has a French title that I can't actually read, read accurately. So I'm, but it's from 1668. So um, I think the edition that I included is a later edition than 1668, but earlier than when it would have been um, taking place so that it would have been what was available at the time. Um, and this is another one of those um, sketches from that first round where I was hoping to expand the story a little bit larger in terms of the number of pages. So that got condensed down to this. Um, the, the left page is supposed to be James in front of the first um, hospital where he was stationed when he joined the army, which was in Plymouth. Um, and then the right is sort of showing all the places that he served as part of the British Army, um, along with his little menagerie. Then this is the, the next uh, variation. This. And this is the approved sketch. And then this is the final art. Um, and these are the reference. Uh, the reference images I was looking at when I was drawing. Um, in terms of like finding reference material in terms of medical facilities for the time, um, uh, it, was, it was somewhat challenging because anything that was sort of created during the time period um, that James was a young doctor um, were sort of etchings that were, that looked to me sort of um, abstracted, like they weren't really accurate. Um, they were sort of dreamlike versions or variations of what would have been real. So I was combining that kind of reference along with photographs that were taken right when uh, photographs started being widely available um, in spaces or medical facilities that I assumed wouldn't have been upgraded in a while. So they still would have had a similar um, look to what would have been available while James was alive. Um, and this is the um, the diagram for that. So the hospital beds are based on multiple uh, stereoscopic photographs um, of hospitals located in South Africa, um, which is where James was serving um, sort of early in his career. Uh, the background is based on a photo of Sing Sing um, by Gustavus, Gustavus W. Pock, uh, which is in Austin, which is where my father lives. Um, an early uh, st uh, stethoscope is how uh, James is listening to the heart of the patient. Um, it sort of looks like a, um, I don't know, maybe like a fake nose that you might put on as a costume or something. It, it's a very odd looking device, but apparently it did, does the same thing or was an early version of what was necessary to be able to listen to someone's heart. Um, and then there's a listing of all the different places uh, where he served. Um, 
once most of the interior illustrations were close to being done, I started um, thinking about what I would like to do for the end papers and the cover. And what I really wanted to do for the end papers was to create um, an illustrated version of the letter that James wrote um, that is where the title from the book came from. This is when James was still living as Margaret. Uh, it's a letter to um, his brother, John. And um, miraculously, this actually lives, the, the real letter lives in the library at Yale University. So the um, very nice librarians at that library sent me the scan of the letter um, and I transcribed it. Um, so I thought I would read it to you. I, there are certain parts that I, I wasn't able to decipher, but for the most part, I think I got most of it. Um, okay, so here we go. John, by this time, I dare say you have experienced the wisdom or folly resulting from your substituting a musket for a goose quill. Either, in the opinion of a girl, may reflect honor on a man if used with spirit in a good cause. In dear, my dear John, a soldier fighting for his king, his country, and his rights as a Briton or Hyber, in my mind acts nobly, honorably, and gloriously. And the old phrase, there is a reward in heaven for all who die fighting for their country, is an article in my creed, and I believe most firmly in it. If you have not quite forgotten your Latin, read what Horace says on the subject. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Was I not a girl, I would be a soldier. However, I must confess I would prefer a sword to a musket, and I would like a pair of colors, at least then, and know how to use them to promote me. And perhaps you may also prefer these useful necessary appendages to a soldier. We must see what can be done for you. Write therefore on account of your intentions and the name of some of the principal officers. John, write like a gentle Moor, or Margaret will blush for your letters. You should also write to your father. Colonel Longfield has promised him to do something for you. There had letter from him days ago direct to him at 32 Fishamble Street, Dublin. Mama joins praise for you and, and use your own words, desires you take care of yourself without any comments on the past. Of you, I am your sister, Margaret A. Bulkley. Um, I knew that it was going to be a hard sell to um, get this to be the end papers. So I decided to basically do my version of a finish of it um, with the hope that it might be persuasive, but it was um, unsuccessful. So here is the, the unused um, final art of my version of the letter, um, which tries as much as possible to um, be as accurate to the letter as possible while having the, the lettering be um, written um, not in cursive, um, so that it would be legible, um, more legible. Um, the last thing I'm going to go over is the cover. Um, there were many, many, many versions of sketches of the cover, and this is not uh, an exhaustive collection. This is a maybe two thirds of the sketches that were done for the cover. Um, but I just thought it would be interesting for you to see how the progression of ideas went. Uh, it's not exactly in the right order. Um, that was a little too challenging for me to do, but it's generally accurate. Um, uh, these are sort of the two covers I had forgotten about that sort of drew that uh, drew my eye to them when I was going through them um, that I think would have been interesting. Um, and here is the first sketch that sort of turned into what the final art is next to the final cover. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So I'm going to try to unshare except I'm not. Yay, thank you so much, Lauren. And You're welcome. Amazing. Amazing. Really excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all that about the process. I mean, I don't think many of us get to see how a kid's book comes together. Um, <laughs> especially when you have an author and an illustrator, it's, it's a collaboration. Um, so far we have one question from Chris, who is wondering if uh, 
if he stayed in touch with his mother after he went to med medical school. Yeah, his mother actually m moved with him. <laughs> so, yeah. She came along for the ride. But, yeah. but after medical school and after he went to London, it, it seems like those communications were disappeared. Hmm. And I'm curious, how did the whole project get started? Was this, was this your doing, Lisa, or? Yeah, I, um, so I, I guess the way it started was that I read a review of a book in The Guardian um, that was reviewing um, a biography that was, that was written about him. And interestingly enough, at the beginning when I first started reading, my thought being a woman physician was that this was a woman physician who had um, cloaked herself as a man in order to practice her profession. Um, and that was actually, this particular biography, even though it was full, filled with detail, was um, that was the premise that this biography operated on. And after that, it became quite clear to me that that was not the case, that this really was um, a, a transgender uh, person. And that, you know, anyway, so, but the, the, his life was so intriguing and so interesting um, that I decided I just, at that point I had dived into the research and just felt like it was really a story worth telling and pursuing and bringing to children. Um, and so um, that's, that's how that started. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, how did you get involved? Um, the art director for this book is Rachel Cole, who is an art director with Schwartz and Wade Books. And Rachel and I um, went to grad school together um, last century. Um, and, <laughs> um, yes, um, and uh, I think that, I mean, I've never talked to Rachel about why she, so she, she thought that I would be the right fit for the book, but I think I, given that I'm trans and that I also um, have done a lot of period illustration work um, and a lot of Victorian period illustration work, I probably was like a an easy good fit, not that, that anyone would like, you know, it just maybe seemed like the right, the right choice. I mean, I don't know how many other people sort of come with those baked in sort of <laughs> life experiences. And we have a, a question from Zoe and Naomi Goldstein. What was the collaboration process like between artist and author? Oh my goodness, what a great question. And I did not plant that, even though those are my children. <laughs> they themselves. Um, I guess I can start and say that um, uh, from the beginning, as soon as Lauren came on the project, which I was thrilled uh, about, um, when children's books are being put together, there's varying degrees of collaborative um, involvement between author and illustrator. And sometimes there's no collaboration at all. Um, and the publishers often, or editors, will keep a firewall between um, the author and the illustrator. And some of that is understandable. They want each person to come up with their own vision for the book. And um, something glorious can be created if, if there isn't collaboration. However, I think once um, Lauren and I met over email and started talking about some of the details, it became clear that having some interchange around um, some of the specificity of the research would be useful. But I had no um, contribution or input into the art, which is probably a good thing. And I, I mean, I think the art just makes this book. I'm thrilled. Um, so Lauren, you're welcome to, to say more. I mean, I think I, this is my first picture book, so I can't speak to what is normal. But my understanding of what is normal is that there's usually very little interaction between author and illustrator until, if at all, sort of after a book comes out. Um, in this case, I was being asked not only to do the illustrations, but I was also essentially being asked to do like an authenticity read on like, for, you know, for the trans experience for the text. So I was being asked to give feedback on the text in a sort of an unusual way from the start before I even got to thinking about what pictures might make sense for telling the story. Um, and I think that led to there being a lot more sort of communication and collaboration. And yeah. we have a question from iPhone. <laughs> iPhone is asking, do Lauren and Lisa have plans for future collaboration? <laughs> you know what, I would love to. We don't have any plans and that's yeah. not how it works. Um, uh, it's usual that 
you know, an author presents a book and then the publisher goes and finds the illustrator of choice that they want to match with the text. Um, but on occasion, sometimes authors and illustrators come together with a, a pairing that they think is a good match, but um, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> iPhone has clarified that they are Amy Roseman. <laughs> um, Ruining the mystery. <laughs> A uh, question from Linda Mandel, her, his family seem to have been very supportive. Was that the case? It's hard to know specifically. Um, you know, this, it, uh, since M Margaret's mother or James's mother moved with him to Edinburgh, you have to sort of assume there's some level of um, support, but we don't really have documentation that clarifies that. And then I also don't even know what happened to the other members of the family, like the information sort of drops away. Is there a biography of James? There are several biographies. Oh, okay. Some of them are like quasi-fictional. There's like a quasi-fictional memoir. It's like, I mean, it's, it's not a memoir. It's like someone writing as though it were a memoir, ah. which I find challenging to, yeah. to sort of, I didn't really touch it other than looking at their reference material because I didn't want to get sort of tainted with false Falseness. Yeah. There are none, that, there's no biography that uh, takes the, uh, his life from this particular angle of yeah. understanding that, that he was a trans individual. Um, and they also- I'm sorry, Lisa, can you speak oh, up a little? Yeah, more? there's none that, there are none, no biographies that sort of look at his life from an angle of being a trans, part of the trans community. Obviously that wasn't part of it. <laughs> standing back then, but you know, we are looking through a lens, refracting back through. So I think that's how we're understanding him right now. And the biographies represent him as a, a woman who faked being a man for 50 years, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense anyway. So um, there, are, there are several out there, but they're not, they're not great resources, except as Lauren says, for the, the material, the research material. Right, right. Um, let's see. Uh, Jacqueline Davies, Lisa, how did historians connect the story of Margaret and the story of Dr. Barry? Oh, well, I, I think um, it's really through a lot of the, um, the writings and letters and sort of finding the, the trace of connection and sort of following the thread of Margaret's connectivity um, the, and then the disjuncture when Margaret then went to go, at that point became James and went to go um, into medical school. So it is, James never wrote about his sort of personal interior experiences or his sense of uh, um, process around what happened. So, but there's a lot of paper trail that, that really indicates with all the various players and there were very, there were a whole bunch of mentors of James's that, um, helped him along, and he was very good at getting mentors who were very useful um, and supportive of him through his life. Um, and so there's a lot of paper trail and letters and writings that make clear indications um, that that um, James had been Margaret before he went off to medical school. I mean, that's the I'm best not, part there. On a more like physical level, I think that you could actually do a handwriting sample from mm. the letters from before and after transition. Um, and it's it's a, an obvious match. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Signature matching. <laughs> uh, we have a question from, and I hope I'm not butchering your name, Sipora Cohen. Lauren, first picture book, wow. How did you decide which mediums to use for the illustrations? Did you try out other mediums before settling on pencil and watercolor? Yeah. Um, so, I, um, I've worked as an illustrator for like 15, 16 years and literally every single piece that I have out in the world as an illustrator um, is drawn in ink and colored in some, in some variety of ways, most often, most recently in watercolor um, and maybe some ink separations that are colored digitally. Um, I think it's fair to say that I had some like a material version of an existential crisis at one point when I was working on the sketches and trying to determine 
what materials I wanted to use. And I was doing these pencil and watercolor tests and it seemed like maybe that would be the right thing to do. But I also thought that maybe I had been hired to do the kind of work that I'd always been doing and been known for. So I asked the art director um, what she thought and she, I assumed the answer would be like, no, stupid. Like we hired you because you do these ink drawings. Like why, <laughs> why would you like even bring this up? Um, but her answer was like, oh, those pencil drawings are really lovely. Why don't you take one spread and do an ink version and do a pencil version and then we'll sort of see how it goes. And then the final decision was to do it in pencil, which was terrifying, but um, I think was a, a good choice in the end. Um, Megan Adler asks, who chose the font? It matches so well. Rachel Cole. Rachel Cole, the art director of the book, chose the font and the, the, the placement of all the text and all of that, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, a comment from Ellie Rubin. I too feel it is an honor to be witness to the process you both worked through. I'm wondering what you, Lauren, are working on now. Ah, um, I have been um, developing a bunch of ideas that I'm in the very, very early stages of. So I can't really talk about them, but I'm in the process of sort of um, trying to get representation to help bring the ideas to fruition. Um, I had a um, illustration rep for like 10 years, um, but she retired and I've been representing myself for the last few years and that has been a bit exhausting. So I'm currently looking for a literary agent to um, help sort of get me to be able to bring more books to life. Cool, cool. Uh, Bob Brady, is there much information about James's love interest partner? Very curious given the times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, his Lord love Tom interest Somerset. was yeah, Lord Charles Somerset of the Somerset family, which is why the part of England that is called Somerset is called Somerset. So yes, there's a lot of information about Charles Somerset. He was married and uh, I, I, throughout the entire time that um, James knew him and was in whatever kind of relationship they were in together. Um, I, I don't know, Lisa, do you have other things that you'd like to add about Charles? Um, I mean, he was the governor of the Cape Colony um, which was James's first posting um, for his military service. So, um, and he ended up being quite a protege of James or protector of James um, and really kind of furthered his career. And James was pretty tempestuous and caused many disturbances in his sort of fight for prison um, reform in terms of healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And it made a lot of waves and um, Lord Charles as the governor would come in and kind of settle the waters and help him out. Um, at some point, there were some folks that James made enough enemies of who actually were exposing the fact that there was a possible relationship between James and Lord Charles. Um, and actually, they were accused of- They were sorry. accused of sodomy. No, that's okay, yeah. So they were accused of buggering. Buggery, oh, yes, yeah, buggery, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, that was not, a, uh, we did not include that in the children's no. book. But, <laughs> but um, they, they managed to recover from that and the charges were, were um, they, they, they were not proven um, and it's not even clear what, what actually happened. But um, they had many, 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 many years of a very close relationship, um, friendship and, and perhaps lovers, but. Um, very early on when James was in Cape Town, um, one of, Charles's children went ill and um, James was sort of credited with with saving that child's life so there was like a very there was like a bonding to the family as well as just a bonding to Charles um, in a way that I think is different than it would have been if he was just um, another surgeon you know yeah. that was working working there Um, Lisa, did you mean, mean to ask this of Lauren <laughs> about the color palette? <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, my husband's sitting next to me and he asked me to ask it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> 
Laura, so yes. Tell us about the color palette. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I went through many different variations of the color palette and to some degree, um, the variations came from the kinds of feedback that I was getting when I was handing in the art um, and having to revise it. And I think part of the problem was that the way I was looking at things physically came, came across a lot lighter than how it came across to Rachel when she was looking at it in the offices. And I didn't really realize that disparity until quite late. Um, so I kept being asked to sort of lighten things up and lighten things up. And once I got to a place where I felt like things were going the way they should, what I was hoping to do was um, have a palette that included um, like subtle rainbows, if you will, as much sort of purple as possible, um, as much blue as possible, um, just to like have these sort of like an, an environment of safeness as it relates to color, um, as it relates to James's identity. And when you're working, um, you're, you're, this is all digital, right? I mean, as far as them seeing your artwork. Yeah, I'm, I'm delivering it digitally, yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when the printed samples of the book, um, the, when the sort of, I, I don't know, it, I guess the, when the F and G arrived, so when I was seeing sort of what it looked like on the final paper, um, I realized that it was just significantly darker than what I had intended. So I printed out the way I was looking at it to show Rachel yeah. the difference. And it, it looked, it still looked good. It just looked different than what I had intended. Um, so I realized that all this time she'd been saying, it's, it's so dark, these lines are so dark. And I didn't understand why, because when I looked at it, it just, it wasn't because something was happening in translation that I don't fully get digitally, but we were able to get to a place where it worked out. Yeah, I wonder about that because that's got to be a strange thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it's also easier when I, I there probably should have been a, like a few more meetings of like bringing samples in to like show color samples of what I was hoping for. Right. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Does anyone else have any questions they want to ask or comment? Uh, it's a total wonderful project. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. We have another uh, question from Tipora Cohen. I'm wondering if Ann Schwartz would speak about yeah. what it was like or, or when this manuscript came across her desk and the decision to acquire it. I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, hi, Lisa. Hi, Lauren. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it was unlike anything I'd read before. Uh, it was brave, you know, to see uh, this story in a book for kids, in a manuscript for kids. And I'd never seen anything like it. And so I was really interested. Uh, yeah. Well, we're glad. <laughs> <laughs> we're very glad. <laughs> but you gave me a very big challenge, I don't know if you remember, before you acquired it, in which you said, I had presented as a cradle to grave biography, and you said, could you do something a little more around refracting it through the lens of gender, how we think of it now, and then, and maybe do sort of more of a, have some narrative, um, intrusive narrative voice in there a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you, you sort of pushed me to do something a little different than just a linear kind of. Yeah, thing. well, that's, you know, a linear, it's picture books to, to fit a whole life in a picture book is, is very challenging yeah. and almost impossible. Yeah, I think impossible is the accurate word, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, yeah, it's, it's great to, to be able to shape the material in a way that um, kind of helps us understand what was special about the person and and to find you know one uh, a, another picture book biographer i work with says she's always looking to find a way in um sort of a a, a lens to see this person through and that's what i was hoping lisa would do and you did beautifully so. 
uh, I'll say as a as a bookseller, I and as a as as the owner of a queer bookstore, I'm thrilled to see so many kids books coming out. I mean, it's yeah, it's, yeah. There are so many coming out, and it's there just, are there are. It used to be a topic that people felt like, oh, you cannot talk to children about anything having to do with gender or anything to do with any kind of controversy that makes adults upset. Um, and I'm glad we're past that point. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I'm just going to plug another I'm going to be publishing a book uh, about a year from now called Pink, Blue and You, Questions for Kids About Gender and, and Stereotypes, which is completely different than this book. It's really straight ahead. How do you talk? To, how, how can parents and children talk about gender and gender stereotypes and sexuality with their with their kids? Um, yeah, I think it's, like it's usually the parents who are the ones who have the trouble, not the kids. <laughs> oh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So there's a lot going on in kids' books right now surrounding these issues. Yeah, excellent. Um, we just have a couple of comments uh, from Ellie Rubin. Very exciting to be with you to learn about this book. Many kids on my list will receive it this coming season. Thanks, everybody. And from Maria John Ferrari, thank you all. Such a lovely book. Congrats to you both. Lauren, did you have a favorite rabbit hole <laughs> or another <laughs> illustration like the medical book that you wish you could um, have included? <laughs> I missed that part of the presentation. But maybe that was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess my, my favorite, I don't know if I have a favorite rabbit hole. Um, I guess the, the research for the, the medical uniforms led me to the New York Public Library's main branch to their rare books. And I found a collection of, uh, that was put together in 1899 by someone who was like a, a military enthusiast in England that had physical samples of pieces of like embroidery and pieces of laces, costume, like drawings of the uniforms, letters to the troops, telling them about changes to their uniforms, just amazing, amazing hand-drawn, handwritten and physical like fabric uh, samples um, that um, were just to die for. Yeah, it's probably my favorite. Yay, New York Public Library. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I'm so glad that this book is out in the world. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and made donations to the Bureau and purchased the book from us. We really appreciate it. Um, even though we're just an online <laughs> institution at the moment, uh, we hope someday to be back in the real physical world uh, with all of you. That's why we founded the bookstore in the first place. <laughs> um, and we miss, we miss being in the same space. And I'm sure that's a widely shared feeling. Um, but unless Lisa or Lauren have anything else to say, I think we'll say good night. No, thank yes. you so much, Greg, for hosting this. this is wonderful. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Nice to Great. Congratulations. I'll mm -hmm. post this online and send you the link. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Jody.